thank you very much and apologize to not come to Vienna because some people strike in French. That's a good thing, but sometimes it's a little bit complicated. So uh, the topic today is uh, Austro-Marxism and internationalism. So as you know, Austro-Marxism is organized as an important and intellectual uh, political trend. Austro-Marxism is a very important political trend. And we would like to return to an element that is to really emphasize because it is associated with the failure of a new international after the First World War. So the perspective uh, of a new internationalism as antidaged by the Austro-Marxist uh, between the two world wars. After the failure to found a new international, Austro-Marxism indeed continued to reflect on political and democratic questions of primary importance. So the first part of my topic is about a new model. I take internationalism here in the sense of a new socialist political project, which had a vocation to be extended beyond Austria. Internationalism is not only dealing with questions of nationalities, but it is being able to propose a new political theoretical project to refund the international socialism a new basis. In this sense, the question concerning Austria between the wars, Workers' Council, Parliamentary Democracy, Republican tradition, resistance to fascism, were thought of in the perspective of a new international project, including many other countries and diverse political forces. I believe that many of the developments of Austro-Marxism in the 1920s from exchange and experience with neighbor countries. Obviously, the experience of the Republic of Council in Hungary, but also the birth of the Czechoslovak Republic, without forgetting the more punctual exchanges with other socialists from countries, for the West countries, said, so let's start with an interesting element. The echo of Austro-Marxism in France in the 1920s and the 1930s. Austro-Marxism had a certain echo among some French intellectuals, militants, and leaders of French socialism. Order, our issue on question of nationalities were of little interest to the French. So, uh, Marxism um, in uh, the French context. Um, and so, for example, uh, one important point is that before the First World War, Austro Marxism was not important for the French people because it was about the nationalities, and the question of nationalities is not so strong in France and in Austria. For example, significantly, uh, the work about nationality was not translated in France uh, before the 1980s and by a small publisher and partially. But on the other hand, um, there were personal contacts between Austrians and French, between Victor Adler and Jean Jaurès, for example, before the First World War, and this contact, which became more important at the end of the First World War. Indeed, at the time of the impact of the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, it was a question of redefining what was soon to be called proletarian internationalism. Bolshevism, Bolshevism sorry, initially proposed a radical solution of an union of Soviets on an international scale, but uncertain pragmatism quickly prevailed with persistent national realities. Faced with Bolshevism, a part of the social democrats in Europe is very hostile. But other, notably in Austria and France, while refusing the communist path, self to define an intermediary between Soviet communism and anti-communist social democracy. This kind of intermediate path was embodied, for example, in France by the grandson of Karl Marx, Jean Longuet, who relied heavily on the international that Austrian social democracy was trying to set up. A real hope animated militants bang forward to Europe to build organizations that were neither Moscow nor Friedrich Ebert. One could say that a priori everything separates the destiny of French Marxism from that of Austrian Marxism. The Communist Party in Austria will remain very small, whereas in France the PCF is a majority station of the Socialist Party in 1920s. However, in the Socialist Party in France, which is more to the left than many social democrats in Europe at this time has remained attached to Marxism. The particular profile of Austrian social democracy is wedged with interest by the French people. It is a hope that it will become a major player in Austria, 
beyond Rand Vienna, which we could establish links with other countries that emerge from the Austrian Hungarian Empire, notably Czechoslovakia. It should be noted that Czechoslovakia is presented in the French socialist press as a hope for many French socialists who see it as a democratic country that could counterbalance other influences. My second point is the question on the relationship between internationalism and the so-called integral socialism by Otto Bauer and his impact in Europe. From the non this Marxist socialism has something very different to say about internationalism. At the beginning of the 1920s, after the failure of a new international, there was an attempt to project itself into a new international order. And I say that uh, so uh, there is a new model of the Soviet Union and the so-called proletarian um, internationalism, and so oh, most, okay. of, most, most of the social yes, most of the socialist parties were very hostile to the USSR and the communist parties, and unreservedly advocate a republican parliamentary democracy without workers' council. And so the Austrian tried to define their one path. On the one hand. Although they were hostile to the political model represented by the Stalinist USSR, they tried to understand the reasons for its experience and refused to consider a priori that any agreement with it was impossible. The Russian way is not Earth, says the Austrian, but under Russian conditions, it can represent a step forward on certain points. For the other countries of Middle Europa, that emerged from the dismemberment of the Habsburg Empire, they advocate an advanced parliamentary democracy where the proletariat must be able to advance its demand and govern. The Renews a single political model, unlike the social democrats and communists, and advocated different socialism with particular characteristics according to national context. Some have seen Otto Bauer's text on the USSR as a form of complacency towards Stalinism. This is debatable, but it also seems that they are part of a broader thought process aimed to as establishing a new international order that takes into account its contradictions in order to make a credible socialist perspective live. So Otto Bauer's integral socialism can first be conceived as a long-term political perspective between socialist and communist, but also as a short-term perspective of specific internationalism, which requires the recognitions of countries with given borders. Indeed, the Austro-Marxism never defend an anti-national perspective, either in the Habsburg Empire or at the time of the foundation of the first Austrian Republic. They are first very far from the most leftist currents of communism, especially, for example, Consulist Communism, KAPD in Germany, which explicitly presents itself as anti-national. They have long believed that the great Republican Germany, including Berlin, Leipzig, Vienna, as well as Graz, was possible which will fulfill the dream of the 8048 revolutions. This project must be carefully distinguished from that of the nationalist currents for whom the greater Germany aim at Germanizing and eliminating, eliminating sorry, specificities of minority peoples. Internationalism, according to this conception, will have consist in developing large supranational structures to avoid the development of micronationalism. Once these large structures has been stabilized, it would have been a question of developing interstate relations between these groups with political and economic agreements. From this point of view, the Soviet Union and other political model can coexist, and the idea of a permanent revolution is rejected as it's the idea of radical internationalism that will abolish borders in the short term. So without being able to find a canonical text definitive in the Marxism, it seems to me possible to see a global intuition that emerged from many Austro-Marxist texts, taking into account the multiple realities without giving into the total pragmatism of many social democrats in Europe. Her point is Republic and Council. 
It brings us to another fundamental question very present in the writings of Austro-Marxists in the 1920s. The question of the Republic and more broadly of political regime that socialists should defend. The reflection they propose is intimately linked to the political situation of Costa and more broadly of the Middle Europa, of course. The revolution in 1918 brought them to the Republic. However, if they were a republic, they were no profound social revolution. But nevertheless, we must <clears> mention <throat> the instruments of democracy. For example, the workers' council that many countries experienced at the time. Of course, Germany, so Austria, Hungary, Italy, Poland, Finland, Czechoslovakia, and also lesser extent to the Netherlands, Luxembourg, England, and Norway. In all these countries, social democrats had to take a stand on democratic issues. But in this context, it must be said that Austria had a particularly strong workers' council movement, which lasted longer than in Germany, for example, as the Austrian Hans Hauptmann has shown. Compared to Germany, the Communist Party remained weak. However, the workers' council were more lively and durable in Austria, due in particular to the presence of a strong left wing of the SDAP around Max Adler and other peoples. If Otto Bauer and Austro-Marxists were very critical of the Workers' Council, others sought to revive them to fight against the party bureaucracy. These particular political configurations partly explain the odyssey of Red Vienna and also draws a particular unfinished conception of socialist republicanism. This consists of defending the achievement of the parliamentary republic while seeking to correct its shortcoming with the instruments of a more direct democracy based in particular on workers' council. And the question of democracy is so essential to define this new internationalism because the austro marxists at this time understood the situation from an international point of view, and with a view to proposing a model that could claim to be universal. In the perspective of defining an so-called integral sorry, socialism, which is neither a simple defense of parliamentary bourgeois democracy nor Sovietism. So the question is, which democracy should be invented, not only for the Austrian workers, but more broadly for the West European capitalist country. And strict, strictly speaking, there is no new definition of a successful socialist democracy. But if one reads the numerous texts produced by the austro marxists of the time, and notably by Max Adler, one finds some very interesting uh, sketches, you can say. On the one hand, these socialists are completely convinced that parliamentary democracy, specifically with a parliament and a representative elected on the basis of direct universal suffrage, is indispensable. This is an important point because it was already the conception before the First World War. This time, this question is clearly decided and concrete now with the Republican regime in Czechoslovakia, Germany, Austria, and other countries. Parliamentary democracy however imperfect, must be defended. And the debate is then, and this is the main interest at this point, about how this parliamentary democracy should be rebalanced to avoid being too oligarchic. While bourgeois democracies set up elitist chamber, like for example in France, the Senate, the Senat, so to slow down the democratic exercise of parliament, some austro marxists so instead to make the institutions more popular by relying on a workers' council. Some theorists, such as Max Adler, try to put forward solution. So Max Adler criticized the Bolshevik voluntarism. He criticized, for example, Rosa Luxemburg and Karim Nesh, but he criticized the, the bureaucracy of the social democrats too. And Adler first kept his confidence in parliamentary institutions, but which to combine them with basic bodies such as workers' councils. He criticized Anton Pankuk or Eman Gorte, who no longer want parliamentary representation. Max Adler also developed a long argument of social exclusion. According to him, in order to prevent these bodies from being taken over by hostile force, only workers should have the right to vote in the Workers' Council. This type of exclusion is relatively undeveloped in the text of the Council law, as Max Adler 
but it recurs regularly and thus constitutes a significant aspect of their argument. It had moreover from the beginning of a very concrete application in Hungary, for example, during the episode of the short life Republic of Council. You can read, for example, the Provisional Constitution of 2 April 1919. And so the Workers' Council, a form of democracy from below, was intended to be an alternative to universal suffrage whose legitimacy was criticized. It was necessary to counterbalance, for some Austro-Marxism has Hadler, the parliamentary representation by organs directly coming from the place of rocks and productions where the weighty categories did not have the rights to vote. And another um, important element, and it's my last point, beyond parliamentary power on workers' council, concerns the means to be used to defend this institution in case of attacks in threats. What to do if conservative or counter-revolutionary force attack this institution, parliament and council workers? The reference to a frontal attack on parliamentary democracy is difficult. And can it be the same in different countries? That is the question. For Austrians, Republican democracy is imperfect, but must be therefore be defended. For example, if the democracy is attacked, Otto Bauer, who was a state revolutionary violence, theorize, or resize, sorry, defensive violence. Democracy and the workers' movement can use violence to defend their gains if they are attacked. Obviously, it was difficult in their position, that of the defender of democracy, to advocate forms of Caesarism and authoritarianism to fight against counter-revolutions. It is difficult to say that it is necessary to have a more direct democracy and, at the same time, to be able to resort to Caesarism. The Hungarian example recalls a large number of Hungarian refugees after 1919 in Austria is still on people's mind with the fear of civil war. But also, I do not formulate ready-made solution to all these questions. It seems to me that the device envisaged by certain Austro-Marxism are singular and original and closely dependent of the political realities of Central Europe. Moreover, it does not seem to me that there is an in-depth study of the echo of Adler writing, writing in the world European space and it seems to me that this could be an interesting aspect to develop. For example, in France, Max Adler was quite successful in merit occurrence of Socialist Party, sensitive to the writings of Rosa Luxemburg. In Germany, those who opposed to the Stalinization of the KPD, Erwin Fregios like um, Paul Levy, found themselves at the end of the 1920s in currents that also wish to reactivate the Workers' Council while remain attached to the achievements of parliamentary democracy. The way in which exchanges between France, Czechoslovakia, Austria, Germany, and in part in the USSR continue will certainly deserve to be better known. Further, we had in gestation a new idea of socialism and internationalism, which could perhaps have made it possible to avoid the worst in the 1930s <clears throat> if he had been developed more successfully. And so, in conclusion, we can say that one could, of course, objects that we have spoken, here's of project and conceptions that have, of course, failed in 1934, and that the destruction of the Austrian workers' movement has largely contributed to the disappearance of these atoms. Nevertheless, in the age of, uh, you know, in history, what is very fashion, it's a what-if history, where we try to understand what other possibilities existed, what Austro-Marxism tried to define in terms of internationalism continues to question us today. Indeed, if we consult the numerous texts of the 1920s on democracy and workers' council, the project of reconstituting a new international, we find an outline of a specific socialist project that still deserves attention. Today, the council, is, the council's movement, the Rete Bewegung of Deutsch, is once again arousing a lively interest beyond historians and in social science, particularly in terms of rethinking everyday life and the democratization of work. Some philosophers and social scientists are relying on the text of figures, such as Anton Pankuk, for example, to seek alternatives to contemporary capitalism. So this period from the end of the First World War to uh, the 
to 1930s also provides elements for a redefinition of a republicanism drawing on the socialist traditions, which, while accepting the principle of parliamentary representation, seeks to, con six, sorry, to counterbalance the aspect um, of the socialist movements that are not necessarily the same as the socialist movement. And this could also provide elements for the redefinition of the Republican tradition of the socialist tradition. We try to suck to counterbalances the parliamentary tradition, um, these elitist aspects by developing the democratic spirit of the concealed born in mobilization from below. At the time of a profound, of, profound crisis of political representation in Western Europe, the debates and experiences remain in part one. The Rhine lies the greatest of this era, despite its tragic ending. It participates in the long unfinished history of the so-called hope principle defined by Ernst Bloch. Thank you for your attention, and I hope you earn me despite the technical problems. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It was uh, you here. They are applauding. I imagine no problem. <laughs> yeah. See you in Vienna next time. And I'm really sorry. Uh, again.